Uh, good morning, everyone. Welcome to the Municipal Climate Change Action Center's Carbon Credits 101 webinar. My name is Ron Patel, and I'm the Energy and Climate Change Advisor here at the Action Center. I can see that the attendee list is starting to fill out, so I'll just go over some housekeeping, but then we'll get started right away. So you're joining us through Teams Live. Um, this means that your webcam and your microphone are turned off. Uh, if you'd like to interact with us, um, there's a Q&A chat box, so you can leave your thoughts, comments, and questions in that chat box. Uh, there is some time allocated towards questions, but feel free to use that space uh, as you think of questions. Uh, one other item is that this webinar is being recorded for future reference, um, and that'll be shared within a, within a few days if you do want to follow up with anything that was discussed today. If you aren't familiar with the Action Center, um, we were established in 2009 to provide municipalities with funding, technical assistance, and education on climate change in order to help them reduce their emissions. To date, the Action Center has been funded by various grants from the Government of Alberta, and we're governed in partnership alongside the Alberta Urban Municipalities Association, as well as the Rural Municipalities of Alberta. Uh, we're quite proud of what we've accomplished over the last decade. Um, you can see some of the stats just shared here in the slide in front of you. Uh, I will highlight the lifetime greenhouse gas reductions at our projected 227,000 tons of CO2 equivalents. This is about the same as taking off 44,000 cars off the road for one year. And we'll be talking more about emission reductions today, um, specifically you know, when, we, when emissions are reduced and we're able to assign them a dollar value, which turns them into a carbon offset credit. Um, so that's kind of the topic of today, carbon offset credits. I'm excited to learn more about it with all of you. Um, I just have a few slides on how carbon credits intersect with MCCAC funding programs, but then I'll hand it off to our guests today after that. Uh, once again, um, you can, uh, there's a time assigned for questions, or you can, um, but you can type your questions into the chat box um, as we go. So carbon offsets that are generated by projects that are funded by the Municipal Climate Change Action Center are what we call retired. Uh, these retired credits are claimed by the government of Alberta um, and then are attributed to government spending and then reported on nationally. What this really means is that municipalities are not able to claim offsets from MCCAC funded projects to put onto the offset market as they would be they would be what's known as double counting. Um, so again, municipalities are not able to claim offsets from projects funded by the Action Center. So today's webinar is all about learning about opportunities in the provincial and federal carbon markets and how can they affect municipal emission reduction projects. Um, obviously, it's a bit of a conflict for the Action Center uh, as we would, uh, we would love to see participation in our funding programs but uh, we want to make sure that municipalities can understand the opportunity that exists in, in the value for offset markets. Um, so we want to make sure that you can make the best decision to guide your municipal action progress. So with that said, um, I would like to introduce our guest that we're very happy to have today, Alistair Hanley. Alistair is a leader in the global carbon markets and is an advisor with the World Bank Group to help operationalize markets under the Paris Group. Alistair is also the president, founder, and board member at Radical, a Calgary-based environmental consultant firm which works on emission markets. And we're just going to transition the content over to Alistair here. Uh, Alistair, can I just ask that you share your screen along the bottom here? Oh, hang on. I thought I had shared it. Did it turn off? Yeah, I think uh, my yeah. slides overrid your slides, but. No Should problem. be a quick quick transition here. Hang on here. Yes, I want to share. There we go. Perfect. And I'll just queue up your webcam so everyone can see you. And I think you're ready to go. All right, fantastic. Thank you very much for the warm uh, introduction. Good morning, everybody. Uh, appreciate uh, you taking time out of your day to uh, to join us. I am very hopeful that uh, you're going to get some value out of this, and I encourage you to uh, 
flood the chat uh, with questions as they come up throughout the presentation. And uh, if there's some critical runs, I, I think Ronick will be able to, uh, to to slow me down and uh, and let me address them. But uh, I do appreciate the opportunity to come and, and talk to you today about carbon markets in, in Canada, in Alberta specifically, but I also want to touch on the impact that the federal government's uh, carbon pricing mechanisms are going to have as well. So functionally, what we're looking to do today is to leave you with a better understanding of carbon market basics, how they actually function, talk a little bit about how credits are generated and some of the mechanisms that can be used to create those credits and how you might be able to take advantage of carbon markets. Um, and there's a lot of things going on in the space that's that uh, perhaps you're not aware of and, and and how those give you these opportunities to work in the space. Uh, a little bit about us. Uh, Radical's been working in the Alberta carbon market since 2008. Um, we rebranded the company this year prior to, uh, prior to July. We were Carbon Credit Solutions, Inc. and CapOp Energy, but We've generated credits from multiple sectors in Alberta, including the renewable energy sector, agriculture, and oil and gas. And in addition to that, our team members have helped develop protocols, which are the methodologies that we use to create credits, including CO2 capture and storage, GHG emission reductions from pneumatic devices in the oil and gas sector, and conservation cropping, numerous other ones. and and we're currently working on one which is a landfill bio cover which is under development which may be of particular interest uh, to, to some of you. Uh, today we have expanded our operations into the US and into Brazil and we've generated over 5 million carbon credits for more than 3,000 clients in Alberta. That said, we're not the only people in this industry. Uh, there are other organizations working in Alberta to help companies generate credits, uh, including Blue Source, Nature Bank, uh, Clean It and Green It, which is an anaerobic composting organization, Rewat Power and Climate Smart Business out of Vancouver. And there's you know other smaller organizations that are that are also in the space. And by the way, Municipalities in Alberta have generated about $35 million worth of carbon credits to date, and that's at the credit price of $28 a ton, which we're currently selling them at. It's not an insignificant uh, number of credits at all, nor is it an insignificant dollar value. Uh, so there have, we're going to dive into this number a little bit more and, and find out which municipalities have been participating and, and the credit values that they've generated for themselves. So I want to talk about how markets actually function and the purpose of those markets. Um, the goal of carbon markets is to reduce greenhouse gas emissions cost effectively. And carbon credits are a low cost compliance option that companies can use to meet their compliance obligation and, and lower their total compliance costs. To give you some context, in Alberta to date, about 55 million carbon credits have been developed since the market began in 2007. And the value of those credits, uh, the, the face value of those credits, if they were all active today, would be $30 a ton. So, you know, a billion and a half dollar market. and it, in addition to that, there's some other compliance uh, instruments that have been developed, which would increase that value even even more. Um, so it is a large market in the province and is continuing to play an important role in the province's objective of lowering greenhouse gases. When we think about mar carbon markets, carbon markets can be divided into three broad classifications. Uh, I'll start with the one on the right, which is an insetting framework. Um, an insetting framework is developed by a corporation that is, wants to encourage emission reductions, either upstream or downstream of the business unit. A good example of this would be an organization like Bayer Crop Life Sciences, which is encouraging farmers that 
purchase their products to engage in sustainable agricultural practices to sequester carbon in the soil or reduce emissions going into the atmosphere. And under an insetting framework, Bayer would be able to uh, talk about the emission reductions that their actions have incentivized. And there are now some global standards being developed to manage credits or emission reductions being quantified under an insetting framework. Uh, the second uh, market that we'll talk about briefly is the voluntary market. There is a significant uh, global voluntary market for credits. Uh, these voluntary markets are managed through a third party registry, Climate Action Reserve, uh, VERA, the Gold Standard and American Carbon Registry are probably the, the largest voluntary carbon registries uh, globally. Collectively, well over 200 million credits were developed and through those registries in 2019. Buyers of those credits would include anybody or organization that wants to purchase a credit voluntarily to offset their carbon footprint. And prices in these voluntary markets can range from a dollar or a little less than a dollar uh, to as high, I've been told, as, as $45. And within those voluntary markets, uh, they're very well structured. Uh, they're producing great credits. And if you participate in the market, you know, your key thing is finding a buyer that's going to give you the price you want. But what we want to focus on today are compliance markets. And Alberta has a compliance market. And these markets are created through regulations uh, at the national and subnational level. Buyers of carbon credits in these markets are large emitters, large polluters that are required under the legislation or regulations of the jurisdiction to reduce greenhouse gas emissions in that jurisdiction. And prices in compliance markets globally vary from say $15 to actually over $100 now in some countries in Europe. And within the, con the construct of risk, Policy risk is something we always need to be concerned with in markets that are, are put in place by a government uh, because as governments change, we're not sure how they will uh, maintain or change the existing policies that we work within. Alberta's carbon market began in 2007 under Ed Stelmack and re remained in place all the way up through to the election of the NDP, who by law was required to change the regulatory framework. Uh, and they created the carbon, carbon competitiveness incentive regulation and increased the price on carbon to $30 a ton. The election of the UCP under Premier Jason Kennedy uh, took some of the elements of the CCIR and some of the elements that existed before that in the specified gas emitters regulation and created a new regu regulatory framework known as the TIER, uh, Technology Innovation and Emission Reductions Regulation. And that's what the market in Alberta operates under today. So within this construct of the regulator and the market, these compliance market, there's a number of different market stakeholders uh, that play critical roles in the market. And, and the first stakeholder is the regulator. The regulator uh, is the organization or the, the body responsible, responsible for creating the rules under which uh, the, market is, uh, the market operates. They approve protocols, and protocols are, in simple terms, recipes for converting emission reductions into carbon credits. Um, these are protocols need to be approved by the government and uh, need to be additional to business as usual. And, and the regulator creates the market framework within which all the stakeholders in the market operate. And today that comes under the Office of Environment and Parks. The compliance entity or the emitter is clearly another very important stakeholder in the market. These are the organizations that need to reduce emissions in Alberta by law. And there's options that they can uh, take to, to reduce those emissions, which we'll talk about a little bit further on in the presentation. But one of those options is purchasing carbon credits uh, to lower their compliance costs. 
We also have verifiers and auditors who play a critical role in this as well. So the verifiers and auditors are really the referees and make sure people are playing by the rules. Uh, functionally, what they do is they verify that the emissions being reported by companies are accurate and they verify that emission reductions that have been converted into carbon credits are real, additional, and meet the needs of the program. Um, so they, they play a very critical role. There's also a registry, and the registry is the, the scorekeeper, as I name it in this carbon market game. And uh, the registry is tracks these uh, emission reduction credits or verified emission reductions, sometimes as they're called, uh, ownership, and works with the government to track compliance to, to make sure that the organizations have met their compliance obligations. And then there's project operators. And these are the individuals or organizations that are making a difference by implementing activities that are sequestering greenhouse gas emissions or carbon into the soil or into trees, or they're implementing projects to reduce greenhouse gas emissions through the implementation of renewable energy projects or anaerobic digestion of uh, waste material, um, aerobic composting, a variety of other activities that reduce greenhouse gas emissions and project operators they're the people that are making it happen on the ground and sometimes you get another group of people that are in the market which i would say are the project developers this is what radical began as now, as a project developer uh, we represented project operators and did the heavy lifting to convert their emission reductions into carbon credits. And really our responsibility as a project developer is to understand the regulations, the protocols, the credit development process, and, and manage that entire process, including the verification and sometimes the sale of the credits, depending on what our clients want. And other organizations that are in the space that I mentioned at the beginning of this slide also act as project developers and provide a similar service to, to their clients. But really the project developer's obligation to its clients is to pick up all the credit development pieces and convert those into credits and eventually a revenue stream so that project operators can focus on their core business. And the last stakeholder, and a very important stakeholder, is the Auditor General. And the Auditor General oversees every aspect of the market and reports on the market annually in Alberta. And one of the reasons the Auditor General's role is so pivotal or so important is that every dollar that's used to buy a carbon credit is a dollar the government doesn't get. And, and that is a really critical thing to remember, right? This is a market opportunity created by the government. They could have simply just taxed everybody, but instead they chose to create a structure where there was an incentive to create emission reductions so that you could get paid for the reductions created and put that market in, into motion. <clears throat> so how, does, how, how do these organizations meet their compliance obligations? So in a compliance market, as I said, emitters are required by law to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. And we, we call that their compliance obligation. At the end of every year, they submit their emissions to government. And along with that, there's an obligation for what their emission reductions need to be. And as they're in a market, they can meet these compliance obligations in a number of ways, and they can choose the option that is best for the business, which gives them flexibility. And if we go down and we look at what these opportunities are, the first thing they can do is they can actually do nothing, which isn't really recommended, and simply pay the government uh, $30 per ton of emissions um, that they didn't reduce. And that's sort of the default worst case scenario, and it adds up to a significant amount of money. Uh, point of point of interest, the, the two biggest producers of greenhouse gas emissions in the province historically have been the oil and gas sector and energy production. And if you're a producer, of either one of those, you could have a, a emission reduction compliance obligation in the millions of tons of carbon dioxide equivalent 
which do the math at $30 a ton, you know, 30 million, $50 million, it's a significant amount of money. That high cost is meant to incent an individual or an organization to reduce a new technology to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. So we're seeing a shift, for example, away from coal-fired power plants to natural gas, and we're also seeing a shift in the upstream oil and gas sector where organizations are investing in new equipment to reduce methane emissions to lower their compliance obligation. And really the last way they can participate is they can reduce emissions in the province by investing in carbon credits or investing in emission reduction projects. So if you're a municipality or a farmer, we do a lot of work with farmers, uh, you don't have a compliance obligation, which means you can change your business practices uh, or implement a technology to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. And because you're not required to do that by law, and because you're doing it voluntarily, you can generate carbon credits and create a new revenue stream. From a temporal perspective, uh, or and a pictorial perspective, so the regulator creates the markets uh, through regulation and the emission reduction targets. The emitters measure emissions, which are verified by the third party. Uh, they then submit those emission reports to government. Meanwhile, somewhere else in the province, an individual or an organization be, can be taking action to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. And carbon credits can be generated from a wide variety of projects in the province. Um, enhanced oil recovery, uh, carbon capture, storage and utilization, uh, there's a forestry protocol that's being developed, so avoided deforestation or afforestation might come into play. Renewable energy projects, energy efficiency of projects, uh, aerobic composting projects, methane abatement projects. It's a pretty significant list of protocols that are in place today in the province that people can use to create credits. So those, action, those actions are put into place and a project, say as a solar project, um, is implemented. And the solar project generates power. And in order to create credits, uh, the activity needs to be uh, governed by an approved protocol. So we have a distributed micro, micro generation protocol approved in the province so that people producing small scale solar uh, renewable energy can generate carbon credits from that. Each ton of greenhouse gas reduced or each ton of carbon dioxide equivalent reduced will generate a single carbon credit, which needs to be verified by a third party verifier, is given a unique serial number and then registered on the Alberta Offset Emission Registry, or the should say the Alberta Emission Offset Registry. And once those credits have been developed and serialized, they can be traded and they can be traded through independent traders, uh, brokers, some banks are getting into trading, or they can uh, be purchased directly from a project developer. These carbon credits are a financial commodity. As with any commodity, there's a variety of ways that they can be traded. Uh, people have even done long-term multi-year offtake agreements, puts, calls, different ways to maximize the value of the carbon credits that someone creates. And organizations are not forced to purchase these credits. They purchase them at their discretion and they purchase them because they like the project. They may want to support the project proponent uh, and support act and action that the project proponent has taken. Uh, it's purely up to those organizations to, to buy the credits that they want and the price is negotiated in good faith. And once those companies purchase their credits, they go into their credit account and they can use those credits to lower their compliance obligation by retiring. Similar to a tax credit, if you make a donation to a charity, you get to claim that credit on your, your tax return and lower your taxes. Carbon credits work in a similar way. You can claim them on your emission reduction report and it lowers your compliance obligation. But once a carbon credit's been used, it's stricken from the, the registry or it's, it's retired 
better better way to say it, and it can't be used again. So credits can only credits can be sold multiple times, but a carbon credit can only be used uh, to help an organization meet its retire uh, meet its compliance obligation once. And when all is said and done, emission reduction targets and compliance or obligations can be met with low cost carbon credits. Rock, do we have any burning questions that have come in in that yeah. long diatribe? <laughs> it was a great diagram. There is a general question about, I think, just carbon pricing in general. Um, so I'll read the question out to you. Uh, the question is, in the case of energy and oil and gas large emitters, don't they just pass this cost onto the consumer by raising the cost of their product? Therefore, how does this really shift them towards efficiency when they are offloading the cost burden of a carbon tax to consumers? It's more about carbon pricing in general, but... Yeah, that's a good one. Uh, big thanks to whoever asked that hard question. <laughs> um, <laughs> look, I mean, I think it's, it's a two-way street, right? The I think they do pass on, right? Certainly we see them pass on to consumers, but what we're really trying to do is drive, drive behavioral change. So in addition to this being a potential burden, it's also a significant opportunity. Um, uh, for example, um, our organization and other organizations like us have the ability to invest in projects that will generate emission reductions and drive those emission reductions down from those facilities. And yes, we can use those carbon credits or sell those carbon credits to other polluters, right, uh, who may be passing those costs on. But as a result of that investment, there is, there is job, job creation and there is ultimately a reduction in, these, uh, in emissions. What's important to understand too is that these emission reduction markets or carbon credits are not meant to go on in perpetuity. Uh, they are meant to help, help mitigate the cost or the capital cost required to switch to a less, uh, to, I don't want to say to a low carbon economy because I don't believe that's the right statement, but to dry, to help drive companies to change the way they do business to lower greenhouse gas emissions. So as a society, I, I, I guess we're all paying for it, but at the same time, if you believe in the, the goals of it as a society, we're all benefit, benefiting from it as well. Yeah, I think that's a great answer. Obviously a difficult question that talks more about just carbon pricing in general, but I think that really is kind of pros versus the cons of having a market-based solution to emission reductions. Yeah, and I think too, and I, I didn't put any slides in here. One of the things that we hear about a lot in, in Canada is what's going on in Canada, and we hear about carbon pricing initiatives in Canada. And you know, we have a national carbon tax uh, that applies across the country, uh, except in provinces that have a tax. And I'm talking about a consumer-facing tax, and we don't necessarily have clarity to what's going on in the rest of the world. And I think a lot of listeners would be surprised to know that there are carbon pricing initiatives in the US where they put a price on greenhouse gas emissions. It's in about 13 states right now. And those greenhouse gas pricing initiatives in the US cover about 30% of the US population. Globally, there's over 60 national and subnational carbon markets uh, that exist today. So we have Canada, we have uh, a whole pile of states in the US, Mexico, Colombia, uh, all have implemented a carbon pricing scheme. If we move west, uh, New Zealand has a carbon pricing scheme in Australia. The government has an emission reduction fund uh, and they've invested $4.5 billion into uh, carbon offsets or that that's what they have allocated to buy carbon offsets in uh, in Australia a very successful market uh, Singapore has a market Japan has a market and has been working with a number of other countries through something called the joint crediting mechanism to incentivize emission reductions China's had third China's had a number of uh, pilot 
uh, carbon markets in the country for quite a few years now, done at the provincial level, and they are also implementing a national emissions trading system in China. Europe is covered by uh, carbon pricing. South Africa now has a carbon tax, and, and the list goes on. Uh, in 2019, according to the World Bank, the carbon pricing initiatives covered about 20% of global emissions and it was valued at about 82 billion US dollars. And this is expected to, uh, to increase to as much as $157 billion per year uh, by 2030 and increase beyond that. Uh, I think it's above $300 billion a year by 2050. So I, I'm, not, uh, I, I'm not a scientist, right? I'm not an economist. Um, but I, I do believe in the power of the market to, to drive change. So Great. with that, let, let's just dive down into um, carbon credits themselves just a little bit. So as I said earlier, a carbon credit represents a verified emission reduction or removal equivalent to one ton of carbon dioxide equivalent generated from activities by approved protocols. Uh, I think I've said the rest of these things on the slide. And carbon credit development, and I'm being somewhat facetious here when I say it follows a simple process, it's not really true. This is Alberta Environment's uh, process flow diagram of how uh, uh, credits are developed in Alberta. And it starts with a sort of a conceptual development of a, of a plan based on a protocol. There's a baseline assessment going, well, what's my baseline condition in terms of energy production? Uh, the greenhouse gas emissions associated with the production of a megawatt of energy available on the grid has a what's known as a grid intensity factor, which is this is how much CO2, uh, CO2 equivalent is, is emitted per megawatt hour of production. Um, you're putting in a renewable solar project, so that's your project description. So you talk and you meant this in something that's known as an offset project plan, which is registered with the government. And then you implement your project and you get into a monitoring phase where you're monitoring what the project is doing. And then you'll go and, and do a third, you'll, you'll undergo a verification which verifies those emission reductions. And once that verification report is complete, you submit it to the registry and then you can go and sell those credits. And at that point in time, the government can come back and choose to audit your project to determine whether or not the credits met the criteria of the program or not. So it's a well-documented and a well-structured process to develop credits. And there is nothing that prohibits any particular individual uh, or organization or municipality from developing their own carbon credits. It's just uh, wading through the documentation and following the processes to create those credits in the manner that's prescribed by the government. Um, and of course, some individuals choose to hire a project developer to, to help them through that process. <clears throat> some of the protocols uh, that I think are of interest to municipalities, uh, distributed renewable energy generation, so solar and wind, Again, as Ronick said, if these have been funded by grants, typically you're unable to turn those into carbon credits because the green attributes are taken by the, the organization providing the grants. Energy generation from the combustion of waste biomass is another opportunity to generate credits where you're effectively diverting biomass from the landfill and, and choosing to incinerate it for power generation. Aerobic composting, as we'll see in the next slide, is, is an area that's been where a lot of credits have been generated. Landfill gas capture and storage, great if you have a really big landfill and it's cost effective. Not so great if you have a small landfill and, and those uh, the economics don't really work. But that ties into the development of this new protocol being developed for the landfill bio cover. So, Currently, credits from these protocols can only be generated in Alberta. And what I mean by that is if you want to sell credits into the Alberta market, you have to generate those credits in the province of Alberta. 
So what's this meant for municipality so far? So 1,257,002 credits have been generated from the following project types in Alberta by municipalities. Aerobic composting, 1.1 million tons. Landfill gas capture, 74,000. Engine fuel vent management. This is uh, where you're actually managing your large, in, large engines to mitigate emissions from the engines. And energy efficiency projects have all generated credits. And the just for point of interest, the energy efficiency projects are uh, coming from, excuse me, I kicked out my power cord. I just got to make sure <laughs> I'll plug it in here. Uh, the energy efficiency projects uh, that were conducted were uh, a lot were street lights uh, replacements, replacing street, my, street lights with LEDs uh, and generating those energy efficiencies. In terms of the organization, so City of Medicine Hat has generated credits worth today about $3.6 million. City of Calgary, about $3.1 million. And the City of Edmonton, uh, about 27, almost $28 million worth of credits have been generated by those cities by taking action above and beyond business as usual and working within the carbon market. And, and for clarity, I used a price of $28 per credit and that would be the value today if those credits were all on, on the open market. The cities may, in fact, have sold them for substantially less than that. I don't have insight into the actual revenues that were generated by those municipalities. So there's a couple of questions here, Alistair, that I think sure. may relate to, um, not to interject too much, but um, there's a question here about, um, can, can you generate credits from a project in Alberta and sell it to a market in a different province or country? The idea, I guess, is trying to find that higher price per ton. Yeah, good question. The answer is yes, sort of. Uh, so there is nothing that stops you from generating a credit in Alberta under the Alberta registry and selling it to a third party who wishes to purchase it at a higher price. Uh, you can generate credits in Alberta perhaps under a voluntary methodology where you, where it's not available to you for the official uh, Alberta market and sell those credits. And then the third way is selling those credits into the federal government system, which I'm going to get to in, uh, in a slide or two. And we'll talk a little bit about the intersection between the Alberta market and the emerging federal government market. Is there another question as well? Yeah, there's one that's just asking about micro generation in general. Um, so how can micro generators easily market their carbon credits? Yeah, and that's going to depend on the size, the size of the project and the volume of the credits created. Um, probably the easiest way to generate those credits is to go to a, a broker and ask them to find a buyer for you. Um, some organizations, uh, like, like our organization, and I can only speak to what we do, we can broker credits, but we can also buy credits. So we're a buyer of credits, we're a broker of credits. Um, you can also go look on the, you can download the Alberta Emission Offset Registry. Um, you can just Google Alberta Emission Offset Registry, and you can go there and you can download a spreadsheet and it will list uh, all of the owners of credits and you can look at which organizations own credits and call them directly if you want to try and find that buyer directly through them. That would be your other way to go. Hmm, that's interesting. Um, there's a couple more questions, but I think I'll just ask one and then let you continue on. Um, where did it go here? This question is pretty interesting. It asks if carbon credits can be generated from new projects only. Uh, I guess they are interested in learning if they can generate credits from projects and savings that are a couple years old and sell those. Great. Um, you can generate credits from projects that were implemented in the past, all right? So if you put a solar facility in, say, three years ago, it is possible to generate credits from that facility, assuming you have the legal ability to do that. 
but you cannot go back. You can't go back in time to claim credits. You're going to claim credits on a go forward basis. So from the day you register that project, you would start accruing credits. And depending on the protocol, uh, typically you can generate credits for eight years over an eight year period and then apply for an extension for another five years. So it is possible to generate credits for as long as 13 years and maybe longer. But the, the ability to generate re credits retroactively no longer exists in the province. So hopefully that's clear. If you have a project that was built a few years ago, if it qualifies, you can generate credits going forward from the day you register that project with a registry, but you can't go back to the beginning of, you know, to when you built that facility to create credits. Um, all right, let's move on because I, I think I'm almost done. Um, talk a little bit about Canadian market. So I think fluid is the best way to describe Canada's current market opportunities, but it's, it's starting to solidify since I first wrote this slide up. Uh, this is a slide deck I put together for Globe in Vancouver back in, in March. Or earlier than that. Um, there are two types of carbon markets in Canada. There are, are provincial markets which exist in uh, British Columbia, Alberta, and Quebec. So these are provincially run uh, carbon markets, right? And then there is the federal government's national carbon market, which is the uh, output output based pricing system. There are there are um, although other provinces are in the process of creating their own markets. Uh, right now, the government of Canada recognizes the markets in BC, Alberta, and Quebec, and has deemed those markets to be equivalent to the federal system. So the market in Alberta gets to continue to operate under the rules and regulations put in place in Alberta. Other provinces that want to enter into the market need to work with the national, with the federal government to get equivalency for their market so that they can take that market and manage it themselves within the province. And it, we say it's a bit complicated and it's all about equivalency. And really what the federal government is saying to a province is that you can manage carbon pricing as long as it's equivalent to what our goals are federally. Um, we've all heard about the Liberal government's carbon tax, right? So that tax again applies to provinces that don't have their own carbon tax. The carbon market is a layer above that, but we're really just focused on carbon markets right now. Um, so yeah, technically a province can manage its own carbon market if the market's deemed to be equivalent. Um, and emitters, so emitters in provinces that have their own carbon markets uh, report to their provincial government and buy credits that are approved by those provincial governments. Emitters in the remaining provinces and territories are covered by the federal government's market. And each market is going to have its own list of approved protocols that credits can be generated from and how credits can be used to meet the compliance obligation in those markets. This is the most, I swear this is the most confusing part about what I'm trying to talk about today. Um, so the federal government is looking to develop protocols for its market and some credits will be allowed from existing markets into the federal system. And this is functionally how it's how it's going to work. So in a provincial market, we have protocols, and then from those protocols we get projects. From the projects we get credits, and those credits can be sold to buyers. That's the way it works in the provincial market. In the federal market, what they're going to do is they're going to develop protocols, right? They're going to have projects that are generated under the federal market. And those protocols will generate credits for the federal market, which is ostensibly a much, much bigger market. But where it gets interesting is the federal government has now officially recognized 
uh, protocols in a number of provinces so that those protocols in those provinces can generate credits and those credits can be sold into the federal market. And these are known as recognized units. And the protocols I think that are, would be of most interest to, uh, to municipalities is the, and I don't have the complete list, I apologize, uh, but certainly aerobic composting was one of the protocols which I believe was approved from Alberta. There was a pneumatics, um, pneumatics protocol for the oil and gas sector and one or two others. So effectively, there's now a number of protocols in Alberta that will generate credits that can be sold to the provincial system or they can be sold into the federal market. It's a one-way ticket into the federal market. You cannot bring credits from the federal market back into, back into the province. So what that really means for certain protocols and certain credits in Alberta, it means that there's potentially uh, more demand for those credits in the national market. So just some final thoughts, right? Um, no, I've got some typos in here. So global markets valued at about, uh, it should be about 82 billion US or 18 billion in 2018. 2019, we're talking about a, in excess of 100 billion. 54 million credits developed in Alberta so far. Retirement value today, uh, $30 per credit. And the federal government is pushing carbon compliance costs to $50 a ton in 2022. And Minister Nixon and the Premier in Alberta have indicated that they are going to uh, move carbon pricing in Alberta up in lockstep with the federal government in order to maintain equivalency with the federal government's market. So the carbon credits that people are buying today at $28 a ton are going to have a compliance value of $40 a ton um, for the 2021 compliance period and are going to have a face value of face value of $50 a ton for the 2022 compliance period. So this is why we're starting to see people buy credits and invest in these credits and look at investing in projects that are going to generate long-term credit streams to take advantage of a rising market. And in addition to that, the federal government of Canada needs credits from Canada and potentially abroad to meet what we say it's, it's, it's NDC commitments, but these are commitments that the government of Canada made uh, to the world under the Paris Agreement to reduce greenhouse gas emissions uh, in the country. And uh, I think they're still working out exactly how they're going to do that. Um, I think that our markets in Canada are here to stay. Alberta's market has lasted through five different premiers. Uh, there's an opportunity to deploy technology through carbon financing. It's, it's real. Uh, certainly, the oil and gas companies um, are taking an, an active role in the market. And I believe that technology providers, uh, including oil and gas companies, need to push the government so they can develop more credits here at home and abroad. Um, there is additional opportunities for um, municipal <coughs> municipalities to participate in this. And I want to highlight a methodology that I mentioned earlier in the presentation that's being developed. And I think it's a ways from development, but uh, a company called Tetra Tech Engineering developed uh, a landfill cap known as a, an aviro-transparative landfill biocover. And what this landfill cap really does is you can put it on a cell that you're closing in a landfill and the cap creates an environment that favors uh, a bacteria known as a methanogen. And these bacteria eat methane as it's leaking from the landfill. So instead of methane being vented to the atmosphere, or leaked to the atmosphere through the, uh, the traditional landfill cap, this methanogens uh, consume the methane and convert it into carbon dioxide equivalent. There's a pilot project in Leduc 
And the numbers coming out of that is that these landfills were reducing greenhouse gas emissions by uh, up to 90% um, by the inclusion, by, by this cap being put on. Um, we've run some numbers based on, I'll, I'll call it more back of the napkin numbers, but functionally speaking, we believe that if the protocol is approved or when the protocol is approved, it'll be cost effective to put these new caps in place and that you'll be able to pay for them in about four years from the credit streams that are generated. And after that, you're looking at a positive revenue flow into a waste management authority or a municipality for another four years or potentially another, uh, uh, I guess it would be another um, nine years if you got an extension on that methodology. Uh, so in closing, right, it, it's, it's not the simplest business. It's a bit complicated, but it's changing. But companies and municipalities have already uh, implemented projects to create credits and they're driving down emissions and they're, they're generating revenue streams from them. And so it's a journey that maybe municipalities and people on the call want to think about to see if investing in a project to reduce emissions is, is more beneficial than maybe taking a grant, right, uh, to put up a solar facility. It, it's lots of opportunities out there. And with that, um, I'll be quiet. And I, wow, we just made it under the wire. I talk too much. I apologize, everybody. But hopefully, <laughs> hopefully you got something of value out of this. Yeah, thanks, Alistair. I think it was a very good overview of the opportunity that exists in the market for municipalities. There are a fair amount of questions. Um, Our so way. Yeah, I'm going to try and I think some of them are a little bit similar, so I'm going to try and group them together, um, hopefully in a way that makes sense. Uh, for the attendees, if uh, we didn't address your question correctly, you can always type it in again, or um, I'm publishing them as we address them, so you can comment in the chat box there as well. Um, so there are two questions here that I think go together quite well. Um, the first one is just generally asking, is there a minimum threshold for credit generation to enter a market? Or can any size project retain a broker to sell their partial credits? And that one I think goes well with uh, a, a specific municipality is asking that they believe the best opportunity to participate in the market is through one of their food waste collection programs, but then they're curious what scale it would have to be to make it worthwhile. Right. Um, typically, uh, Buyers of credits are, are looking to purchase larger volumes. However, I can tell you that we've generated credits from projects uh, that generate a, a small volume of credits throughout the individual project. And what we've been able to do is bundle those with other credits and sell them. I, I think there's two, there's really two elements to the question is, will the project generate enough credits for the entire credit development process to be cost effective? And then if it is, you will find a buyer for those credits. It may take a bit more time if the volume is not significant. Mm -hmm. The lowest volume of credits that we've, or the, the smallest project that we've generated credits for, it's uh, probably a project that generates about two to two and a half thousand credits per year. And we'll verify that project every two years just to make it more cost effective. But again, you know, there. To answer that question in more detail, I'd actually have to understand the project type and look at what the potential potential volumes are. Right? Yeah, for sure. Fair. I think the this next question kind of touches on something you just said. Um, so this person wants to know what costs are associated with generating the carbon credits so they can be sold on the market. So what are the costs for right. quantifying and verifying? It it depends who you work with. Um, in our agricultural business, we generate credits for our clients, and I'm going to say for free, right, with quotations around that. We actually don't charge them anything, and for most of our clients, we don't charge them anything for the credit development services. What we do is we take a, a commission, which is a percentage of the volume of credits generated, and we actually make our money by selling those credits into the open market. So if we don't if we aren't successful in generating our clients' credits, 
uh, we don't make any money. And that's really a way to reduce the, the barrier. It is possible for uh, a company to go and work with somebody who does it more in a consulting, um, consulting role. So if you're interested in engaging with a consultant to create your credits, uh, we would look at that, Blue Source would look at that, some of the other folks at the beginning of the presentation would likely look at it. Um, if you want to bear those costs internally, your verification costs are going to probably be in the order of ten dollars to $20,000 a year, uh, depending on the project type, maybe a little bit higher. But you can do it so that there's no upfront cost for creating the credits if you, if you want to have someone take the risk and take something on the back end of the project. Very interesting. There are a couple questions here about timelines. I'm going to try and group them all together, although I don't know if that's going to work great. Um, the first one is asking about the timeline for the typical reporting process. Mm -hmm. Is there a um, certain number? So typically what happens, uh, again, let's uh, we'll say a project goes into the grounds. Um, let's assume a project is going into the grounds on the January 1st of next year. So the project's in the ground, it's up and running, regardless of what that project is. Uh, you're going to start gathering data uh, and evidence to prove that the emission reductions occurred. If the project is generating a massive volume of credits, I'm talking hundreds of thousands of tons a year, you could potentially go to verification in the first six months of the project or at the, at the end of a six month period and bring those those credits to market. Typically, uh, what happens is people let a project run for a year to get a full year of crediting, then go through the process of getting those credits verified. So from the a date that a project is commissioned and in the ground, realistically, you're probably looking at about an 18 month time frame uh, to complete the first verification, quanti quantify those credits, complete the first verification and sell them into the market. Yeah. And I think this kind of relates to a little bit. Um, so this person wants to know if, if you generate credits in a particular year, for example, 2018, can you apply those credits to compliance obligations in a different year, say current year? Yes, you can. Credits have a, light, a shelf life of nine years. So right. you can generate a credit today and you can sit on it for nine years and, uh, and take it to the market then. And we've actually seen a significant amount of uh, capital appreciation in the market for people who bought credits back around 2014, 15, 16 um, and took advantage of the big price swing in the market when the, the price went up. So there are large compliance entities buying credits today that will use those credits to meet compliance obligations when the price is $50 a ton and they're going to reap the benefit of that financial investment. That's good to know. And then Cassie has a question which I think may relate to a specific slide, but she's asking if you can speak a little bit more about the time frames that were mentioned. Um, she is um, talking about the 13 year timeline and what that means for a 25 year solar PV system. Um, so I'm not super sure what Cassie is asking. Okay, I, I, I understand. Yeah, perfect. So, uh, you know, the, the you put in a solar PV system that has an expect a life expectancy of 25 years. Uh, what we can say with certainty is that if if it the, if you haven't built that with grant money, you can generate credits for an eight year period today. You can then apply for a five year extension to generate credits for additional five years. You can apply again and again, whether or not you can generate credits for the full 25 year lifetime of the, of the facility is based on a number of factors that the government's going to be assessing. So as we green our grid, right? or as more solar facilities are developed, the government may, may come to the conclusion that the carbon market isn't really needed to incentivize additional solar development, in which case they would not uh, allow credit production to continue. So you got to go within the time frame that, that you know, and I would be anticipating a 13-year crediting period 
for those uh, any credits that come off facilities you have. One of the other things that's interesting is we, we talked about um, different models to to buy and sell credits. It is possible today to enter into agreements with buyers of credits for up to eight years uh, of those those credits. So if you wanted to lock in a revenue stream for eight years, it is possible to find buyers that will enter into a purchase agreement to purchase those credits for the eight year period. And then you've got some revenue certainty coming in and you can get creative as to how you might participate uh, in that secured payment for those credits and still somehow play in the, uh, the, the potential increase in prices for those credits over time. So lots of, lots of ways to, to tackle those longer term finance issues. Perfect. There are a couple questions left. I know we're bumping up against uh, I'm good. time. Yeah, I'm good too. So I'll just uh, let the attendees know, you know, if you do have to run, um, you can access the recording that will be sent out afterwards. So uh, no worries if you don't have the time to stick around. But for those that are able to stick around, we'll address the rest of the questions here. Um, so this next question from Jesse, um, I think it's looking at more of the provincial lens of it. Um, he's at, they are asking, um, does it take a long time to generate a new protocol? Uh, is, and is there a minimum size project that makes new protocol development worthwhile? Yeah, thanks Jesse. The protocol development follows a process, right, within the government. It starts with a, a concept note so you would provide a concept note to the government. They would review the concept note and determine whether or not that protocol was one that they wanted to pursue. Uh, the protocol development timeline is, you're, you're looking at 12 to 36 months, depending on the methodology and the complexity of the methodology. The costs vary depending on the protocol development methodology. But, uh, you know, and the other thing is, is that when a protocol is developed, the protocol uh, becomes public, so anybody can use that. So you'd really need to look at it from the perspective of what's the project type, what are you predicting your revenue streams to come from that, that project, and uh, is, are those revenue streams worth the, the cost of developing that methodology? We do know that both federally and uh, I think provincially, it's fair to say that the governments are looking for credit development opportunities and they're always open to taking concept notes in and, and uh, seeing if something's appropriate yeah. for their, their program. Yeah, there is a follow up from Jesse. Uh, it might be worth it to take it offline and then follow up uh, sure. outside of the webinar, but he's just saying, or they are saying, uh, if we had a project but the protocol did not exist yet to generate credits from the project, uh, they want, can you walk us through from, from a very zoomed out view, 10,000 square feet, what it takes to develop a new protocol? So I think you kind of yeah, addressed no, that we, there. We can do that, but yeah. you know, if need be. But it is on the government website as well, right? Mm -hmm. In terms of that uh, credit development process or the protocol development process, I apologize. Uh, perfect. There's a question about uh, retirement value. Um, just looking for a clarification on what that. Sure. So uh, when I, uh, if you go back and think back to what I talked about, the compliance costs that an entity pays if they simply choose to pay the government and they don't make emission reductions, it's a, today it's $30. So if they have a carbon credit, they can give them the credit and they save paying $30. So we say the retirement value is $30. Two years from now, the retirement value is going to be $50. So if they're not going to pay a penalty in two years, or if they're going to pay a penalty in two years when the price is $50 a ton, that's what they're going to pay per ton. Or if they have a credit that they purchased for, say, $25, although they paid $25 for it, the retirement value is now $50. So by submitting that credit, they don't have to pay the $50. Hopefully that uh, clarifies that for you. Yeah, you just uh, left a comment. It's perfect. Um, there's a couple questions here about protocols. 
Um, so one is saying there's a newly approved protocol from the federal government about feed for animals. Uh, would this be eligible in Alberta? Um, yeah, that's sure actually an Alberta protocol that exists in Alberta. Um, it's generated, I think, about 100,000 credits. Um, and so it is an Alberta protocol that can generate credits to be transferred into the uh, transferred into the federal system. And then Shan is asking, is there a grasslands or native prairie conservation protocol? If there isn't one, wh why not is our question. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, actually, there isn't a federal protocol in place for uh, avoided grassland conversion or grassland conservation. And I think you'd have to talk to folks at Environment and Parks as to why that is the case. It, it's, there's some complicated reasons. However, there is a protocol uh, developed by the climate or the, by CAR, Climate Action Reserve in the US, which does allow us to generate credits in Canada through grassland conservation and sell those into the voluntary market. Um, there are some challenges around that, but uh, again, happy to talk more about that offline if you want to find out more about what's required to generate credits from that protocol. Perfect. Um, so there's two questions left. Um, I know there's been a lot of questions, so thank you for answering them in what I tried to put, to, put them together in a logical way, but the next question actually is for, uh, for myself at the Action Center. Um, so is there a chance that the MCCAC or the AUMA or the like would be interested in pulling together multiple municipalities to increase the scale to make it worthwhile? Um, maybe I'll, I'll ask. So Alistair, aggregation is something that is possible with uh, carbon offset markets? Yes. So we, uh, again, in our, in our agricultural sector, we generate credits for about 2,850 farmers now, uh, and it's all aggregated. Mm -hmm. We have put together the first aggregated project for microdistribution in the province for a series of small scale solar projects that we generate credits for. And it's um, it really comes down to what the, as we aggregate this stuff up efficiencies of scale. Um, so the more we get, uh, the happier we are. And it is possible to do it from virtually all project types. Perfect, and that's good to know. As far as the AUMA or the RMA being involved, um, I'll just say that uh, both organizations are, you know, member-focused organizations. If there's interest for membership to do something like pulling together municipal uh, offsets for the carbon markets, um, you know, we'd be if the action center is the one delegated to do that work, we'd be happy to do it. Um, so if you are able to encourage um, your local officials that sit on various AUMA or RMA boards, um, that would be the way to kind of get that going. But we would love to do that if we were kind of tasked to do so for our membership. Um, and then I saved this question for the end because I think it might be just a nice way to tie everything up. Um, so the question is, with growing focus on achieving net zero emission, the language around such accounting is increasingly focused on carbon removals as opposed to avoidance of carbon uh, generation. Um, so do you think that this discourse will produce a market differentiation between removal projects, things that are like nature-based solutions, or avoidance projects? I think it already has. Um, case in point, Microsoft uh, put out an RFP earlier this year uh, to purchase a million uh, credits developed specifically from removal projects. Uh, when we think about nature-based solutions globally and what's globally, um, there is a big focus on removals uh, specifically from the oil and gas sector. And to get to net zero, we need removal. So it's either going to come through nature-based solutions or it's going to come through direct air capture, like some of these big projects that are being developed now, um, which were funded in part by Emission Reductions Alberta, where uh, they are now have got the engineering in place where they're pulling CO2 directly out of the air 
and converting it back to a uh, petroleum product. But I think the nature-based solutions are going to play a critical role on a go-forward basis. And I think that as, uh, or what we're seeing now in things like the Carbon Disclosure Project, which is a, a global uh, project where companies and municipalities can report their emissions publicly and go through a very rigorous process for accounting, I think we're going to see more of that. And uh, we've seen more of it in Australia for municipalities. And in fact, I believe the city of Edmonton, I think it's the city of Edmonton, I could be wrong, is already part of the carbon disclosure project and reporting its emissions out to the world through that framework. Um, and so when I think about where the future is going, I think there is going to be increased demand for carbon accounting. What are you emitting today, right? What does that look like? And uh, how are you going to, what's your strategy to mitigate those emissions, right? Either reduce those emissions or offset those emissions. And, uh, and that can turn into a credit development opportunity to create credits, or it can convert into an opportunity to, to purchase carbon credits. And uh, though I, I'm not supposed to advertise, so I'm going to stop there. Suffice to say that, that these are all things that, uh, that we're working on today, right? And, um, and I don't want to cross any lines. <laughs> I'm trying to be very careful, but that's where I see it's going. So whether you're doing that internally or externally or with, you know, our competitors like like Blue Source or uh, or uh, Rewat Power or Nature Bank or Climate Smart Business, you know, these are all organizations that are working towards the same goal, which is cost effective emission reductions and uh, a cleaner, greener planet. So if there's you know a way we can help, we're happy to have a conversation and you know and have a conversation just for the sake of the conversation too. Yeah, thanks for the transparency, Alistair. I know um, it's a difficult line not to cross there, but <laughs> I, I will encourage people that have more questions to definitely follow up with Alistair. I think we clearly saw today um, that there's a lot of information and the audience was very engaged. There were 23 questions, so thanks for taking the time to address them all. Um, but, but I think that last question really was able to close out uh, kind of the theme about today. Um, do you have any kind of last comments you wanted to leave with everyone? Uh, no, I, I think that um, I just encourage people to read up and be cognizant of what's going on. And and if you have questions, reach out to, to people in the space. I think it's a, I think it's a real opportunity. Um, and I think the challenge is, is being able to especially in these these times of fiscal restraint i think it's even harder for people to be able to find the time to to look at some of these things um when we're pressed from time doing our our regular job but i do think it's important and uh, i i wish everyone good luck in moving forward with their projects regardless of what they are so beautiful well thanks again alistair for joining us today um, I did have a last slide here, just plugging some upcoming webinars, but I know we're way over time. But you can just check out um, mccac.ca slash events for some of our upcoming webinars. Um, and yeah, just thanks for everyone that was able to join us today. Um, you know, let me know if you have follow-up questions or you can always connect with uh, Alistair as well. So thanks everyone for, for joining today. Yeah, thank you for your time, everybody. I much appreciate it.